Royal food served on the grandest tables is so much more than just a meal. Historically, these extravagant dishes were created to represent power. They also set fashions. Nowadays, royal food is all about showcasing the best of British. In celebration of royal food, we know it's the Queen's recipe because we've got it in our own hand. From the present and the past. That is proper regal. We recreate old family favourites. Now, the Queen Mother had this really wicked trick with these. What a yep. mess. We sample royal eating al fresco. Oh, wow. That yeah. is what you want. And revisit the most extravagant times. Pheasant, stag, turkey, salmon, oysters and turbot dressed in a lobster champagne sauce. Unbelievable! This is Royal Recipes. Hello, I'm Michael Burke and welcome to Royal Recipes. This is Audley End, one of Britain's finest stately homes. Built in the style of a royal palace and once owned by a king. In the splendour of the gardens, halls and kitchen of this grandest of country houses, we'll be recreating the food served at the highest royal tables. And it all starts here with this gem, a royal kitchen maid's cookbook, the only surviving recipe book of its kind in the Royal Archive. This is an exact copy of the original, which is kept at Windsor Castle. Inside, the recipes of Mildred Nichols, who worked at Buckingham Palace in the early 1900s. And for the first time in over a hundred years, we'll be bringing these recipes back to life. This time, we cook the food members of the royal family choose when they're away from their public duties. The personal favourites they enjoy with family and friends, whether at a picnic or dining out. Today, in the Royal Recipes kitchen, chef Anna Ha creates a dish that would have found favour with Edward VII and his mistress, Lily Langtry. I admire Edward VII. If I had this, all I'd want to do after this, go to sleep. <laughs> Historian Dr Polly Russell visits the restaurants given the royal seal of approval. Princess Margaret so loved this pie that she would send her butler from Kensington Palace to come and get one. And Michelin-starred chef Anton Mossiman reveals how cooking for Prince Charles is all about homegrown produce. He wants the best, and for me that is exactly what I cook for, the best. In the magnificence of the Victorian kitchen wing, we start with stout-hearted fare, fit for the gourmand king, Edward VII. Hello, I'm here in this grand kitchen of this stately home with Anna Hoare, who's executive chef of a top London restaurant. A bit different from this, I imagine. Oh, absolutely. It's like a dungeon where I normally work. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we're going off duty with the royals, taking a look at some of the dishes they're served in some of their royal haunts. First stop, Rules Restaurant mm. in Covent Garden, London. It's supposed to be London's oldest restaurant. Yeah, famous for its game. Famous for its game and famous for being the rendezvous for Edward VII when he was Prince of Wales and his mistress, Lily Langtry. Yes, naughty Eddie. <laughs> With the bonquette. Anyway, we won't go into that. One of the things he uh, probably had, actually, because it's famous for game, is, is uh, woodcock on toast. Yeah. But they wouldn't have it as a main course, would they? This no, is, no, no. This, this is a savoury for the end right, of the Jeff. meal, after the sweet pudding. That's it. Yeah. So they could continue... Uh... Ah, the port tastes a bit better after something <laughs> savoury. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, you're not going to do this kind of woodcock. No. You're going to do a completely different woodcock dish. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to do uh, woodcock pudding. Mm. And I love recipes like this. And when you say woodcock pudding, mm. this is... Woodcock pudding like a steak and kidney pudding, exactly. not like a dessert. Exactly, yeah. exactly. OK, so the first thing I'm going to start with is the suet pastry. You can make it hot, you can make it cold. Today I'm going to make it cold. So you just add your suet in, pinch of salt, and then you want to add your water in kind of gradually. It's roughly about like 100 mils or so of water. It's a really simple mix. You just have flour, suet, pinch of salt and water. When you do actually uh, uh, make a recipe like this, yeah. you realise why it was ever created because it is meatier than just using butter or olive oil. More sustaining. Mm, mm. 
So what are you doing here? You're just mixing it or are you trying to crush it as no, well? No, I'm just bringing it all together. You see, if, if I add any more water, it would come together easier, but it would be too wet. You can okay. dispose of that for me, we please. Uh, so I've lined the mould with just a little bit of butter and then also like a... Oh, you've got something on the bottom? Yeah, a bit of greaseproof paper on uh, the bottom, just to make so sure, stick? just in case. I don't think it would stick, but I'm just being, you know, well, extra careful. Stick. Just because you're around, Michael, I'm uh, just being extra uh, careful. OK, so I'm actually going to take a little bit of this off yeah. and this will go as, as the, the top. Yeah. And then on the kind of line of it, just roll it out. Really is has a feel of an Edwardian dish, doesn't mm, it? Mm, it does, yeah. Of chaps with ample girth <laughs> putting down their cigars and and uh, tucking in. I'm just going to roll it on the rolling pin so that it doesn't break. Yeah. And then just place it over the bowl. And then fit it in. Yeah. And it's a very forgiving pastry, you know. It lets you away with blue murder. So we can just squeeze it into. Is that why you like it? That's why I like it. Yes, it's very forgiving. Good squeeze around. Yeah. So I'll roll the lid before I go to finish the mix. OK. So this is going to be the top of the thing. You're going yeah. to pop this on here once you put the, the contents of the pie exactly. in there. You know, you want to have a lot of time to do this. This isn't something you're going to rustle up in 15 minutes. You know, it's something that if you have it ready in advance, I think it's a bit of a showstopper. Yeah. So what are you going to put in here? OK, so um, now we're just going to add in um, the raw chopped woodcock. Mm -hmm. Raw? Yeah, raw now, because you're going to cook this pie for quite a few hours. Yeah. So, and a bit of parsley. In here I've sweated down some mushrooms with some onions and uh, I've got a bit of demi-glaze in there. Mm -hmm. And demi-glaze. Demi-glaze? Yes, it's a bit Sorry. of a, a fancy word for meat stock that has been reduced down. Right. has some red wine in it. And a little drop of Madeira has gone into our one as well. So that's ready to, that's ready to go that's inside great. the centre. The demi-glaze. Yeah. Poncy, isn't it? But doesn't that look beautiful? It does. Just it look does. at it. Yeah. So now Put that we're going to... Yeah, and we're going to squeeze it down, our forgiving pastry. going to let me away with blue murder. This is brilliant because it barely even shrinks at all. It will shrink a very small amount, but it, you'll see when I open up my pie later on. So you just want to clean it up, mm -hmm. cut around the edge. Now. Yeah. And then your tinfoil goes on top, buttered tinfoil so it doesn't stick to your, your pie. And you just make sure that your foil is nice and tight because you're Snug. going to steam yeah. this. Yeah. Um, and it's important steam that you it. actually don't let the steam in, it's mm. more that the steam is cooking it from the outside. A steamed suet pudding. Yes. This is straight out of the past this, isn't it? So here is one that's been simmering away now for the past few hours. How many hours? Three. Three hours. Three hours. This now, isn't fast food we're talking about. Now, now Michael, my hands aren't asbestos, so you're going to oh, have sorry, to move. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm so excited. I love this. <laughs> yes. I love this so much. <laughs> like genuinely, I love yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Give Do you like woodcock itself, yes. or is it just the pudding that excites game, you? Game in general just excites me. Okay. Oh, look at oh, that. Look at that. <laughs> isn't that beautiful? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's absolutely stunning now. Now what you just going to run a knife along the edge yeah. just to make sure that when I flip this over that it doesn't stay stuck. Oh, but that just smells amazing. It, does, doesn't it, it smells amazing. Okay. Now, this is a big moment. This is a big moment. You're just going to bump. Pretty much. So right. let's hope I don't mess it up. Okay. Oh! <laughs> now, Very deft. Yes, well, the second thing I'm hoping for is that it releases. Ah, right. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I say. Oh, the smell of that is just... That's the first sniff. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, yes. OK, it's, so it's, the last it's thing... warm and... Oh, yeah. So the last thing we're going to add, two things we're going to add, yeah. is a bit more demi-glaze or a bit more gravy. Demi-glaze? Yeah. And just oh, put it on gravy? the top. Oh, is that Yeah. Uh -huh. Demi glaze is posh gravy. Yep. And then, to really make it luxurious and special, I am going to put some truffle on top. Oh. Just for you. It's just for you. Okay. But this is aroma, pure aroma. Oh. So the joy of truffle is the speckles going everywhere. That to me is just beautiful. Oh. 
You can imagine Edward leaning over, his whiskers all twitching with appreciation. Wouldn't have thought Lady Langtree had too many suet puddings. No, I would not think so. Mm. Not by the looks of her. No, indeed. So there you have it, steamed woodcock pudding with demi-glaze and truffle. Wow. Now, what would you serve it with? Maybe some crushed swede and some fresh, freshly steamed greens would be nice with that as well, I'd say. Okay, let's crack this little... F this is really hearty stuff, isn't it? Oh, my Oh, look at that! Goodness. Look at that! Oh, 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 oh. That is so delicious! Oh, 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 oh. <gasps> if I do say so myself... Okay, come on, come on. First, I'm going to try the filling. Okay, I'll do that too. Mm. I'm not sure I had woodcock before. Mm. Tell me what you think. Mm. It's so good. Lovely. Isn't it so the, good? The meat is really tender, isn't it? Yeah. We better oh, have some love, of that suet. Yeah, I love the pastry. Mm, 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 mm. 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 So much yeah. flavour. Yeah. All it's inside. rich. Yeah. Really, really rich. It's just soaked up all of that. Mm. Mmm. This is lovely. But I admire Edward the Seventh. If I had this, all I'd want to do after this, finish the glass of port, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> the Prince of Wales was breaking with royal tradition when he dined out in a restaurant. But I can see why. Decades after Edward VII's first forays, younger royals started dining out as regulars on the restaurant scene. Historian Dr Polly Russell explores the range of royal tastes. Princes William and Harry are as at home in a burger bar as a royal banquet. Their mother, Princess Diana, was a regular at fashionable eateries like San Lorenzo, having her own table there in the 1980s. But the idea of princes or princesses going out to dine at a restaurant was once unthinkable. It wasn't until the 1930s that a restaurant actually reserved a table for an HRH. And that's where I'm going now. Opened in 1929, Quaglino's quickly became the restaurant for bright young things. Until this time, fine dining had been stuffy. But here, the dress code was relaxed with cocktails flowing and a heaving dance floor. By 1935, it had even tempted notorious party boy, the future Edward VIII. Hi. It's so nice to meet you. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. This is the most amazing place. Thank you. Current head chef James Hume has been overseeing the most recent refurbishment. Prince Harry was at the launch party. There's a sort of history of royals coming to Quaglino's, isn't there? Yeah, it comes back to the 30s when the old Prince of Wales came in. He had his own room. He had his own room? Yeah, there's a, there's a private dining room just behind you. We'll still call it the Prince of Wales to this day. Fantastic. And I suppose he could have gone there and abandoned the sort of formal dress codes of the day and sort of relaxed with his friends, presumably. Yeah, exactly. What was the menu like in the 1930s? So much different to today. It's very, very classical French. Oh, really? And written in French? Like all, all in French. All in French. Yeah, it took me a while to translate them. <laughs> Two decades later, following the royal abdication and post-war depression, a new set of young royals emerged and started to hit the town again. By the 1950s, the Princess Margaret was ready to party again, and this is where she came. She used to have a cornered-off table called the Royal Enclosure. It was called the Royal yeah, Enclosure? Just for her, every night reserved, so she could be seen really? and see everyone else. I'm not surprised, because it is the most fabulous, glamorous, exciting place to be. In 1956, her sister, Queen Elizabeth, came and dined here, according to Quaglino's, and that was apparently the first reigning monarch to ever come and eat in a restaurant. So, so I'm told. <laughs> By the 1960s, however, Princess Margaret sought out a different dining experience. Around the corner from Kensington Palace, this hideaway became a favourite for her and her husband, Anthony Armstrong Jones. In 1965, when Princess Margaret and her husband used to come here to eat, these were her favourite booths to sit in. It's a space that's about intimacy, relaxing and feeling comfortable. That must have been the most wonderful thing if you were Princess Margaret. This new relaxed style of dining in the 1960s was a direct contrast to the traditional formality of eating out. 
To me, that really speaks of a moment in Britain where we are starting to question the sort of hierarchies and rules, and that, and that plays out in terms of food. The restaurant was originally named Nan's Kitchen in the 1960s, serving home-cooked food. It said that their chicken pie was Princess Margaret's favourite, and she enjoyed it so often that they changed the eatery's name to Maggie Jones in her honour. In the 1960s and the 1970s, Princess Margaret so loved this pie that she would send her butler from Kensington Palace to come and get one to eat at home. And I've heard that some members of the royal family still like to come here. Glamorous royal haunts in fashionable London, but for many of the royals, their favourite haunts have been as far away from London as you can possibly get. Yeah, and ever since uh, Queen Victoria, they've been mad about Scotland. Yeah, the late Queen Mother in particular, she had uh, that Castle of May. Yeah. Right up in the north of Scotland. Any further, and you're in the Shetland Islands, <laughs> <laughs> I think. But the Castle of May has got its own cookbook with a foreword by Prince Charles, yep. which gives you a bit of an insight into the way of life up there. Yeah. And today I'm going to prepare a Queen Mother's favourite, jam puffs from that cookery book. And also, it was one of my favourites when I was a little girl. So I'm going to show you how to make them today. Okay. Okay. These are things you can gobble. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And it's super easy. I mean, um, all you need is some puff pastry. This mm -hmm. shop-bought uh, roll-out puff pastry is perfectly fine. And uh, you just want to cut out mm -hmm. as many discs as you feel your belly can take. <laughs> <laughs> But I think recipes like this are so special because you feel like you have a bit of insight into the kind of more normal or familiar side of, of the royal family. Especially yeah, you get you the sense relate. with the Queen Mother up in the Castle of May that uh, this was kind of, by royal standards, very simple country life and probably looking at that cookbook as well. Fairly simple, if rather upper class, um, fair as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we have all our discs here now, mm, nice. and we're going to make uh, six of the mincemeat and six of the jam. So would you uh, mind helping me with that? Uh, would you do the jam ones and I'll do the mincemeat ones? Absolutely. OK, so on so one side, is this? this is apricot jam. So on one side, you just want to give a bit like a, like a small teaspoon of, mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, jam. Now, I will be judging you on this, so uh, I know, if I know, it's I know. wrong, I'm a bit You'll be greedy, tidying actually. up. You can do the washing up afterwards. You've got the easier one. It's difficult to get the jam off the spoon, yeah. isn't it? So try to keep it on one half, one side. Oh, on one side, OK. Yeah, so one side. Well, you're going to fold it over, of and course. Then, exactly. And then we're going to put the egg wash on, uh, on the other side. Here we go. Oh, I've got a lot on that one. Yeah. Now, you're very slow. I'm streets ahead of you. I'm very fast. So I'm just going to go ahead with my egg wash. OK. <laughs> they love jam, the royals, don't they? Uh, they, they apparently... At Buckingham Palace, every Sunday, they used to have something called jam pennies, which is just a, actually just a jam sandwich and, and cut into penny-shaped sizes by a cake cutter. I think it was mainly for the kids. Yeah, I'm going to say I would have loved that as a kid. Yeah. So you need to egg wash your... Uh, 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 Come on, okay. chop, chop, yep, yep, let's yep, go. Right, I'm going right, right, to right, start chef, folding right, right. as you're doing it. Well, I'm making a mess of And that. give it a good squeeze. Actually, I think I've got a rare talent for this sort of thing. I think you do not, but let's keep going. Right. Uh, I think you've okay. just got... High standards. You can't recognise potential when you see it staring <laughs> you in the face. <laughs> OK, so when uh, you've egg washed them, you want to fold them over and give them like a really good squeeze. So you're kind of squeezing mm. out the air of them and sealing it really, really well. Like a little fruit pasty, if you know what I mean. There's nothing to this cooking lark, is there? No, it's easy Just, peasy, just, just turn it, pie turn it over like that? Yeah. And then what do you do? You're trying to tuck in the filling so that you've just got the pastry on the outside. OK. Oh, well, ah. shouldn't have been so greedy. The um, jam's coming out, though. <laughs> Might have a little bit too much jam in there. <laughs> in all of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's greed for you. It's yeah. a man thing. Yeah. Here we go. OK, well, actually, the fun bit happens next. So now we're going to cut them out. This bit I, I actually quite like. And as a little kid, this, is, this was definitely a, a side of it that I loved. Yeah, neatness wasn't the Queen Mother's thing, really, because... They're jam puffs, but I think the Queen Mother had a bit of a wicked sense of humour. Uh, rather liked them as kind of booby traps for oh her dear. guests. Yeah, I'll tell you more about it. You're, gonna so, uh, you're not going to tell me beforehand. You're going to no, no, booby no, no, trap no. me. Maybe, I, maybe, I, yeah, maybe I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to do what the Queen Mother did to her guests. Is that revenge for me getting you to help me to bake? Exactly. 
They go straight into the oven just like this. We don't egg wash the top of them. No. So that, Why is when, that then? when we take them out, we're going to dust them with icing sugar. Oh. And then a bit of magic happens. You put them underneath a grill yeah. and they turn into this beautiful kind of caramel mirror on top. It's wow. lovely. Yeah. So um, I might leave these ones yeah. for later. Yep, yep, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Absolutely. So I'm going to put pull, these pull. Um, straight into the oven for about 10 minutes at 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. Now, these ones are already cooked but they're not finished. There's still one more stage to go. So if you just pass me the icing sugar there, there please. Go. And the sieve. Yep. So all we're gonna do is dust these with ice, icing sugar on top. And then we're gonna grill it, we're gonna grill it underneath, um, just your normal grill, uh, but with the door open. Because you've gotta with keep the door an open. eye. Door open, you've gotta keep an eye on them. Within 30 seconds to 40 seconds, these will turn into caramelized, Kind of glazed mirrors sitting on top of your <laughs> your jam. But it's puffs. really just a flash grill. Yeah. 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 Nice and hot. Okay. That's my kind of cooking. So Takes 30 seconds. That sounds wonderful to me. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> Fast food. <laughs> so I'm going to take this over to the oven. Uh, come back soon. How's it going, Anna? Okay, they're just starting to get crispy, Michael. That sounds good to me. How's it going, Anna? Couple of more minutes, Michael. Keeps this up, I'm not gonna let him eat them. Come on, Anna. <laughs> they're ready. <laughs> Check these oh. out. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, that looks really nice, doesn't it? Are we ready to try? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, come on. Now, the Queen Mother had this really wicked trick with these. She'd set off on a picnic with her guests. Mm, and they loved a picnic. They the loved a picnic. And they'd sit down, and these would be served, and the Queen Mother would say, there's a traditional way to eat these things. You've got to bite the top off. Mmm. Mm, really nice, by the way. And you have to, traditionally, Fill it up with cream. Oh my God, what yeah. a mess. Oh, wait a minute. Fill, exactly, fill it up with cream and then eat it. Now, there's no tradition whatsoever of doing this, <laughs> but what it, the end result is, watch. <laughs> you can't do it without making a complete mess. Because all the people in the presence of royalty, they've got their little fingers yes. stuck up and all this sort of thing. And then, you know, I think it was rather cruel. Yeah. Okay. Are you going to have one? Yeah, I'm going to have a go. Have one of my better ones. Oh, you've got to have the... There's a tradition here, Anna. Okay. <laughs> you've got to fill this up with cream. Mm. There you go. I just want to see you make a mess of yourself. I'm not going to make a mess. I'm not going to make a mess. Go I'm going to eat go. like a pro. No. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. <laughs> go on. <laughs> mm. 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 I don't care what I made a mess. Those are really good. You were disappointingly neat about that, if I may say so. <laughs> disappointingly neat, mainly because you shoved it all in your <laughs> mouth, all in one. Well done. You managed Queen Mother's obstacle course. Yeah. Rather better than most of her guests ever did. <laughs> <laughs> I might have another one. A passion for jam puffs isn't the only royal favourite of the late Queen Mother. She also championed a rich egg and prawn dish created at another Scottish haunt. From Kilbo House in Perthshire is just six miles from the Queen Mother's childhood home of Glam's Castle. Once owned by her nephew, Drum Kilbo was often visited by the royal family. It was here that the Queen Mother first tasted their signature seafood delicacy, eggs Drum Kilbo. Anna's here to find out the recipe's origins from the Lord of the Manor, Geoffrey Bunting. Welcome to Drum Kilbo. I'm Geoffrey. This is the drawing room. Oh, wow. My goodness, this place is fabulous. This house evolved out of a medieval fortification, which belonged to the great Robert the Bruce. So, Geoffrey, tell me how did eggs from Kilbo come about? There was a royal party staying here in my predecessor's time. And one member of the party was very late in arriving and they realized would not be here in time for dinner. And the chef, Gladys Davidson, improvised a cold dish 
to leave out for the final member of the party. And that was the origin of Uf Drem Kilbo, which was then picked up um, and used at later royal occasions. Mm. Waiting in the Drum Kilbo House kitchen, where this royal favourite was created, is Chef Mark Boole. It's a lovely dish, uh, very simple to make at home. We'll put some of the harder ingredients in first. Mm. The lobster, then we put in our prawns, a bit of tomato puree, mm -hmm. a small amount of Tabasco, mm -hmm. the anchovy essence. Mm. I love anchovy anchovies. essence. Get that in there. Give this a little bit of mix around the side. You want everything, but the time we put the mayonnaise in, you want it all evenly mixed mm, mm. and not any lumps as such. Mm. OK, so we'll put the tomato in here now. Mm -hmm. A lot of tomato goes in here. And we come to the mayonnaise. That's a lot of mayonnaise. You don't want it to be pure fish that you're mm, eating. Mm, it is. Mm. It's like an upmarket prawn cocktail. Mm, mm. So it does have to have its proper amounts of mayonnaise. In. So we'll mix this very lightly. You don't want to mush up anything at all in here. Mm -hmm. Now, the last thing we put in, the eggs. Now, have a taste. Mmm. Oh. oh my God. Good. Mmm. So many different flavours. Mmm. Next stage. I think I can help you with this. Yeah, one. you can. That's good. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Mmm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Are we going to have enough for these? Yeah, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, so we don't want to put too much in the mayonnaise. You want it to look, have a bit of character rather than just flat, as you've just done. That's good. Well done. <laughs> we'll put a little bit of garnish on them. This little piece of fancy tomato. Oh, okay. Easy to do, put a little slice through it. And I always like dill. I love a bit of dill. I like dill with any kind of fish. It's nice and soft, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. plenty of flavour. And is it true that the royals have used it often as a picnic dish? It's a favourite of the Queen Mother's, but I know that a lot of the royal family also like it. Mm. Do you reckon they're using the same recipe as you? I would hope so. So am I eating a dish fit for a queen? Well, you are. Now, some people will change it a little bit, mm. but this is the original recipe. Eggs Drum Kilbo has travelled far beyond its Perthshire roots. For staff travelling with the busy royals, an understanding of their personal tastes is essential. Grant Harold here has been butler to uh, Prince Charles and Prince William and Prince Harry and been off on several trips to their haunts. Uh, you were based at Highgrove when you were Prince Charles's butler, but you, you went on tours with him to some of these places. Absolutely, and I felt very lucky to be able to travel to Castle May, Balmoral Castle, Sandringham House, so, and Holyrood, obviously, as well, uh, the, the kind of main residence in, in Scotland. So it was quite a privilege to be able to kind of travel around with him. Was it a fairly gamey affair? I mean, how, what are these places like? They're, 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 I mean, they're, some of them are huge, as you, as you can imagine. Uh, they can be a little bit eerie. Uh, I remember being at Castle of May, arriving up uh, there, and it was my first evening. Uh, went to bed after obviously doing the dinner. As you can imagine, quite tired, sat in my bed, and suddenly I felt this thing hit me in the back of the head. And I looked up, and there was a bat, and I thought, fantastic. <laughs> just what I, just what I mean, always <laughs> wanting a bat flying around the room. So I very quickly opened the window, and it, it went back out. So, Did you yell? I did actually. Yes, I did. I, I yelled rather loudly. I think I think um, I think the, the royals and the staff all could hear my my screams. And being a butler there when you're on the road is that different from being a butler back at Highgrove? It's very much the same. Do you mix Again, more with the royals? Well, you do. I mean, you're still doing all the traditional jobs of a butler, serving the table, as we said, looking after the guests. But at the same time, they actually allow you to get involved in, for example, the kind of balls that take place, the the parties. I mean, I've been so lucky that I've been invited to many different royal events including the Gillies Ball, which is obviously quite a famous dance at Balmoral Castle. Have you danced with the Queen? I have danced with the Queen. <laughs> really? I, I danced with the Queen and the Duchess of Cornwall, and this was a, a dream of mine when I was a youngster. I remember watching this documentary about the Queen and seeing the Gillies Ball, and I thought it would be amazing one day to actually get to dance with her, and little did I realise, probably about 20 odd years later, there I would be dancing with the Queen. Does Prince Charles take his own food with him from Highgrove? He's a bit of a foodie, isn't well, he? Well, he's a, he's a, I mean, a huge uh, believer in, in, obviously, food with a, being grown organically. Uh, Highgrove's a fantastic example of that, and I think, uh, like any 
anybody that's kind of believes in growing things the correct way, you know, the food will travel around. And he's passionate about it. You know, he, he really pr pr promotes organic uh, food, and obviously you can see that from Highgrove. I'll bear that in mind. Thanks. <laughs> Prince Charles is always keen to talk about food, particularly with his chefs. One renowned chef who's very familiar with Highgrove produce is Anton Mossiman. Four generations of the royal family have enjoyed his cuisine, and he's a firm favorite of Prince Charles. I was asked to cook for Prince Charles the first time in Prague for the Prague Heritage Fund. So 350 people for four days. It was an incredible occasion. Most head of states of Europe were actually part of it. Since then, we've been cooking many, many meals for him. I must say, he, he loves his food. It's such a pleasure to have such a distinguished guest with such good taste. They both share a passion for food and how to grow the best quality ingredients. I was brought up with organic food. In those days, there was nothing artificial. Everything was fresh from the farm. Not necessarily the most expensive ingredients, but the best. And you can do wonderful things with very basic, simple produce. His Royal Highness the Prince, very much on the same line. We have very much in common, and uh, when we talk about food, it's always a fantastic pleasure. It's not just the food this Michelin-starred chef uses, but his style of cooking that finds favor with royalty. 25 years ago, I created Cuisine Naturelle, a style of cooking without fat, without cream, without butter, less salt and less sugar. So instead of salt, I used fresh herbs, and for less uh, sugar, I used orange juice, grape, whatever fruit juices to make it up. It's what I like to cook. And that's what people today like to eat, because it's healthy, it's fun, it's sharing food, and it's very honest food. Today, Anton is preparing a typical high-grove dish. This dish is a saddle of lamb, high-grove lamb, a fillet. The quality is just outstanding. Look at the color. No fat whatsoever, all just plain, pure meat. I can't really wait to tuck into it. I roast it with some fresh rosemary. As a garnish, I have roast new potatoes, kale with some spinach, Brussels sprouts, just the leaves, and carrots. First, we heat a bit of oil, go back a bit of salt and pepper. You know, I'm a great believer that food should be seasoned before it's cooked. Because once the pores are closed, you can't season anymore. You have to season it beforehand. I just want to sear the lamb on both sides very quickly, nice and brown. A piece of rosemary. The smell of fresh rosemary now is just so beautiful, just fantastic. So off it goes in the oven for about three minutes. Anton has cooked for the grandest of occasions, but many of his royal fans have also come to his private dining club in Belgravia. Here, I uh, am cooking for friends. I'm cooking for people I know. It is like a big family. It's fantastic, only this week we had the head of state here. Because it's private, uh, that's what people like. Back in the kitchen, after three minutes in the oven, the lamb is ready. Anton serves it with a red wine sauce. Perfect for any royal occasion. I had the pleasure of cooking for His Royal Highness 50th birthday party. And this is exactly the kind of food he likes. He wants the best. And for me, that is exactly what I cook for, the best. And if this tasty dish observes the best principles of healthy eating, it surely allows for a spectacular dessert. Our palace kitchen maid, Mildred Nichols, was clearly influenced by the chef Escoffier at the favorite royal haunt, the Savoy, when she created her millefeuille Mont Blanc. Pudding time now. 
Time to wind back the clock. Time to open the recipe book of our kitchen maid, Mildred Nichols, who, remember, worked in Buckingham Palace in the early years of the 1900, and a wonderful putting it, look, Anna, Millefeuille Mont Blanc. Mont Blanc's the mountain covered in snow, which might be appropriate later. Millefoy, a thousand leaves. Escoffier's recipe, wasn't it? Yes, I think you're right, yeah. Royal chef. <laughs> King of chefs. Yeah. Do you think he was the king of chefs? Uh, well, I think uh, it's up for debate. You know, there's been a, a few greats, but you know, he's definitely up there. Are you going to do this? The very same recipe? I'm going to do it exactly the same as she did. She as did. Mildred did it yeah. 110 yeah. years ago. Absolutely. What do you start with? OK, so we start off with our puff pastry. You need to cut out five discs. Um, you need two cutters. One needs to be um, your, your large one and then a smaller one to cut out the centre. Now, this is the puff pastry, the thousand leaves. That's Escoffier right. thing. In the school tuck shop, it was called a cream slice. Oh, right, yes. Well, this is or a vanilla posh. slice. This is a posh. A pot cream pot. slice. Okay. Um, so we're going to. Uh, these have been baked in the oven at about uh, 180 degrees for mm -hmm. about 20 minutes. So we're going to stick these discs of puff pastry together with an apricot jam. Um, so I'm going to use a brush for this. Mm -hmm. Brush it all around. You're going to make a tower of this stuff. That's yeah? right. Yeah. And use apricot jam as the glue. That's right. Exactly. Um, so it gives a bit of sweetness to it, mm. and just like you say, it's like a glue. So we place it on top. You know I love building things. <laughs> looks like fun. And this will really make it stick, would it? Or yeah, this just... will stick because the, the, the jam has been warmed up so to make it more liquid. Mm -hmm. So then it is. It's like a little sweet glue holding it all together. It's quite a tower, isn't it? It is. And then we're going to fill the centre with some cream and some chestnut puree. Um, so uh, at the end we'll finish it as well with the marron glacé. Are you putting is... some on the top as well? Because that's I the top it, of your stack. Yeah, and I think it needs the sweetness as well, yeah. yeah. So tell me about the other ingredients you've got now. OK, so um, you have your uh, whipped cream, yep. you've got your chestnut puree, and you've got your marron glacé. Now, marron glacé is, is what, a, a crystalline... Uh, ho uh, not horse chestnut, chestnut. Yes, that's right, yeah. yes, uh, kind of very... The French love them, don't they? Yeah, they do love them. They're mad about them now. I'm not 100% a massive Why? fan of them. I don't know, I think it's the texture, but also, I, I, I also think it's an acquired taste. You're right. Do you yeah. like them? I don't know. Can go I on, see go if I can it. acquire yeah. it? Go for it, go for it. I'm pretty keen on nuts. How's that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've acquired it this minute. <laughs> Okay, so oh, that's quite nice. I'll put that. I'll have that later. Okay, so let's let's start with this. I'm going to start with the puree in the centre, spoon. So is that a pureed version of the? Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly it. It is a pureed, and you can you can buy chestnut puree. You don't have to make it yourself. Okay. Um, and I'm going to put a little bit of cream. Oh, so you're centre. doing this? So it's the you want to fill the centre. It's like a surprise yeah, inside yeah. it, so nobody knows that that's there. So until you cut into it, so another kind of big spoon of that. So you're doing a layer each of these as well. The whole yep. thing is in layers. Yep. But this is cream and the pureed chestnut. Yep. Cool. It's quite a, a, a unique uh, cake. I've never seen anything like this before. No. But then it's a combination of two things, isn't it? I mean, the meal foyer is one yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and Mont Blanc, that, that is a cake all to itself, isn't it? You're so knowledgeable. Honestly, I think you're teaching well, me. <laughs> you know how it is. Years of experience. <laughs> but that's right, isn't it? Mont Blanc is a, is, is, is a, a cake with in chestnut. and of itself, yeah. with, with chestnut. chestnut puree. Oh, right. And presumably it's got cream on the top, like the snow on the mountain. Oh, uh, yeah. Chestnut. Yeah. OK, so... Oh, my gosh. Yeah, plenty of cream on top. It's a Weight Watchers cake, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you're not on a diet when you're eating this. Surely not. Golly. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. OK. Yeah. So the whole idea is to kind of pile it up on top yep. and then kind of gently nudge it around the sides. That's why you want to kind of top heavy so it can kind of drip down. Now tell me, Mildred was a, a, a pastry chef at Buckingham yeah. Palace. Yeah. And she was there, I don't know, 14, 15 years and she managed to get from being seventh pastry chef to being third or fourth pastry Which chef would have been over a huge that thing. whole career. Yeah, but that would have been a huge thing because once you'd get a job like that, you'd never let go of it. So you'd be waiting for people to be dropping like flies before you could get promoted. <laughs> but you were a pastry chef. I was, God, And now many, you're many executive moves. chef and a real boss. Yeah. Many. Tyrant, I think they call you. A tyrant, but, uh, a tyrant, yeah. yeah. No, over, over a couple of restaurants. Nobody would dare say that to my face, but uh, no, I'm not a tyrant. But you've had the opportunity for promotion that she presumably wouldn't have had. No, but, um, uh, I mean, it's a different world now, yeah. so cooking them back then. I mean, the opportunities are huge. Back then, you know, to, to work for the royals, there was 
you know, that's the best job she, she could have gotten. Yeah. Presumably she'd never have been first pastry chef, let alone no, well, like you, an executive chef. Oh, well, Women I mean, didn't... she probably wouldn't have been allowed because she was a woman. Yeah. That was left up for the boys to be in charge. So you're putting pistachios on the top? Yeah, I'm going to put pistachios yeah. on the top. I'm quite generous. Give it a sprinkle. Um, Why? Well, it's a, well, it looks nice. But yeah, but I think... It gives it, it a crunchy top to it? It gives it a lovely crunchy top yeah. and yeah. a um, lovely flavour off your pistachios as well. So now I'm just going to... Ooh. I know, actually, it's, it's pretty heavy. Oh, yes, this is a bit... Don't drop it, don't drop it, don't drop it, don't drop it. Oh, well done. I was never going to drop it. Okay, so now I'm going to bring this to here, and um, I think in Mildred's recipe she does uh, mention placing the marron glacé around. On the side? Yeah. I have a feeling this is partly her creation. I don't know why I think that, but just reading the recipe I feel like there's a, an interpretation from that her. That she made it her own in some Well, perhaps. I mean, I'm sure there would have been opportunities for them to... Experiment. To yeah, the, there must yeah. have been. Well, they must have, have spent long, long hours in the kitchens. And then also I think Mildred did mention the idea that she just piped a little bit of cream in between. This is decoration, one. isn't it? And you kind of hope you'd get one of the marron glacé in well, your slice. Well, that's that's what you'd be hoping for. Yeah. Well, that's what and you're. That's, you. that's actually that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we're perfectly matched here because you don't particularly want the marron. No, glacé. I don't. But I wonder if I was we to make this for myself. For yeah. Of what might be a nice alternative could even be any fresh fruit yeah. because it's cream yeah. and pastry. It could be lovely with some strawberries. Or Something to cut into that yeah. softness of the yeah, taste. Yeah, could be yeah. quite nice. Yeah. Okay, shall I put that over here? There we go. Yeah. I might have a bit more of my marron glacé. So there we have it. Mm. Milfoy Mont Blanc. Tricky thing to cut, I would imagine. Yes. Mm. But don't let that put you off. That, I'm, it's not going to put me off because you're going to cut it. <gasps> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Right up. Uh, let's put that there. <clears throat> okay. Oh yes. Oh yes, yes, yes. Going through. Mind you, I am rather good at this kind of stuff. <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, is that about the right size, do yeah, you think? Yeah, I think okay. them as a portion. Oh, no, I don't want to wreck it. Don't wreck it. Yeah, I'm not sure I've gone all the way to the bottom. <laughs> there we go. Now, have I made a complete Horlix of this? Well, this looks okay. You don't sound terribly convinced. I'm not convinced. <laughs> Here we go. There. That's not bad. That's not bad. Mm. Oh, there we go. Mm. Now I missed the marron. There we go. I'll pop it on the back. Yeah, well, you can eat that because I'm not interested in the marron glacé. No, no, the marron glacé. What about you having the other bit? Mm, 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 mm. Go on. Okay. That wasn't exactly a big bite. What's it like? I'm being careful. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. Is it? Mmm. Okay. Mmm. <laughs> mm. It tastes back to the school tuck shop. <laughs> Only that was a bit better. Mm. Mm, but I was a bit younger, so... Mmm. Keep going. Go on, have a bit more. No, I'm okay. I think I'll leave it up to you. Mmm. No, I like it. And I'm going to finish it off. Mm. It's going to take me a bit of time. And we have to go, I'm afraid. That's it from these celebrations of delicious and sometimes rather wicked royal haunts. See you next time. <laughs>